Basically, you guys, what we're going to talk about today is the DMRTA checklist. Um, for those of you that don't know, basically what we did is we came up with a checklist that you'll see on your screen in just a second, but it looks something like this. And the idea was that, you know, a lot of guys will buy a DMRTA. A lot of shops bought a DMRTA maybe, you know, nine months ago or a year ago when it first came out. And they, they love the idea and they know that they need one, but they aren't always necessarily sure what to do with it. Um, you know, I normally travel around and do trainings and I can't tell you how many shops I, I go into and I ask them, hey, what do you do for testing? Do you have an RTA? Do you have an oscilloscope? Do you have this? Do you have that? And the answer is usually yes to at least one of those questions. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of times that RTA or oscope or DMRTA is sometimes sitting in the corner of the shop collecting dust uh, because they bought it because they knew they needed it. but They don't know what to do with it. Um, or they don't know which order they're supposed to go in or whatever the case may be. Now, of course, there's always more than one way to do something. Uh, maybe our way is not your way. Maybe you think there's a different way or a better way. Hey, more power to you. This is just one way that we came up with to help guys that need a little bit of uh, instruction. So basically the checklist is a walkthrough of when you're pulling a car into the bay and you're not familiar with what it's gonna take to integrate with that car. Um, a lot of times you pull something in that uh, may or may not be brand new, but maybe you've just never worked on one before. Um, I can think back at my own shop where we pulled in a Hyundai, it wasn't a Hyundai, it was a Genesis sedan. It was one of the G80 or something like that. Big luxury car, right? That car had like 20 something channels, 20 something speakers of audio in it. And we had never done one before um, because it wasn't a Honda or Chevy or, or Toyota or something more popular, there was literally like no info out there on that vehicle. So, you know, at the time we didn't have an RTA, we didn't have an oscilloscope in my shop. We were lost with that car. I mean, we spent days trying to find signals that were going to work and do we need to sum and is there full range and all this stuff. If we would have had a DMRTA or an RTA and an oscilloscope of some sort and a checklist like this, we probably could have solved the majority of those questions in like 20 or 30 minutes. We spent two or three days tearing our hair out, trying to make that car sound the way it was supposed to. So, you know, that's really our whole goal with this is just to make integration um, a little bit easier and kind of streamline the whole thing, especially for the guys that aren't that familiar with it or aren't that, um, you know, used to doing uh, integration like that. You know, maybe they've done a couple high to low adapters and a couple of LC7Is, but they're not used to bringing in multiple signals and doing summing and all those things. And, you know, a lot of times I talk about this a lot when I do trainings, but when you're pulling in a car that you're not familiar with, you know, most of us, unfortunately, just kind of get to work, right? We start disassembling panels. We start um, trying to find factory amplifier, trying to find signal, doing all these things. Um, and next thing you know, it's middle of the afternoon. We haven't really got the install figured out. We've got a bunch of products put in, kind of, sort of. We've got wire everywhere, and we think we're getting pretty close, but really, we don't even know if we found full range yet, or we don't know if we found a usable signal yet. And, you know, that's, that's I think, one of the worst things is, is it ends up being four or five in the afternoon or early evening, and next thing you know, you're calling your customer, telling them that, hey, the product that my sales guy sold you or that I sold you isn't quite going to work. You know, I thought it was going to work in your vehicle, but now I figured out that we need signal summing. Now I figured out that I need something with AccuBase. Now I figured out that we need something with more input channels or whatever the case may be, right? But if you could do all that in, say, the first hour of the day or even the first half hour of the day, and you could figure out 99% of those questions, wouldn't it be nice to go into an install and just know right off the bat? okay, I'm going to need signal summing, I'm going to need AccuBase, I need eight channels of input, I need, da, 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 da. you know, it would be so much simpler. And the rest of your day will go so much better. You'll be in such a better mood when you're not dealing with that stuff at the end of the day, right? Nobody wants surprises. So let's eliminate those surprises. Let's do it efficiently. And now you can be a little bit more professional about it too, right? We always talk about maybe putting together a tuning and testing cart. So a lot of shops are, are taking a, a, you know, a roll, roll away cart, a $20 cart, whatever it is, and mounting a laptop and a DMRTA and all their test leads on it. The other thing that I would recommend having on that cart is a clipboard with a bunch of these DMRTA checklists printed out, 
right? Now, every time you're pulling a car, you're not worried about going and printing one or grabbing them. They're just ready to go. It makes things so much easier. So if you're not familiar with the DMRTA, I'm sure most of you are, but if you're not, the DMRTA is on your screen right now. It's also sitting next to me on the table. This is our ultimate technician's test tool or ultimate audio test tool, however you want to think about it. Just like it shows on the screen there, this is all of these tools built into one. It's an oscilloscope, it's an RTA, of course, it's a polarity checker, an SPL meter, and a voltage meter all wrapped into one product, okay? So there's a lot to it. There are multiple ways to connect to the DMRTA, and for some of you, this is gonna be redundant because maybe you've watched me do a DMRTA training before, but some of you have never seen this stuff, so bear with us here. So if you've never connected to a DMRTA or you're not familiar or you're wondering how, there are two ways to connect to it, either via USB or via Bluetooth. If we're connecting via USB, there is a USB cable on top of the product over here where the power switch is. There's a power input. On the other side is a USB uh, input over here. This USB is for connecting to your computer, um, whether it's Mac or PC, we have software for both. If you wanna connect wirelessly, you're gonna use our Bluetooth chip, which is the AC BT24. That's gonna plug into the option port on the front of the DMRTA, okay? Um, if you are connecting to the option port and using Bluetooth and going wireless, you are going to be using a tablet or a smartphone. So just to be clear, if you're using the Bluetooth chip, you are not going to Bluetooth the DMRTA to your laptop, okay? If you're using a laptop, you're gonna use USB. Um, I personally prefer using USB only because it's instant, there's zero latency, everything is just a little bit faster. Um, as we all know, we've all dealt with Bluetooth before. Bluetooth is great, it's convenient, but it has its little latency things. You know, sometimes there's a little delay and things like that. So when you're using something like the RTA, uh, I, I really recommend USB. It's just, you know, faster and a little cleaner to me. So anyhow, that's kind of the basics of uh, connecting to the DMRTA itself. Uh, also on the face of the DMRTA, you'll notice all of your inputs and outputs, right? So you're looking at the DMRTA in front of you right now on your screen. I've also got one here in front of me. And when you look at this guy, you've got all of your inputs and outputs on here. So you've got uh, XLR or uh, microphone input. We have our quarter inch in and out, uh, RCA unbalanced in and out. And then we have our digital outs. So we have a digital coax, digital optical or toss link. And we have our USB out. And down here is the speaker level input, okay? This is an input, not an output. Uh, the knob that's on the face of this controls the volume of the internal test tones and pink noise. So we'll cover that stuff in a minute and you'll kind of see how that goes. So let's get into a little bit about the DMRTA itself and some of the versions. This is another uh, question we get asked a lot is, hey, I saw you guys offer it in a case. Can I get just the case? Uh, I already bought a DMRTA, what's the deal? So this is just a couple of, of uh, moments here to kind of go over that and, and clarify some of that for you. So we offer the DMRTA three ways, okay? We offer the DMRTA as just the tool itself uh, on the left-hand side of your screen there. So the DMRTA, if you order just DMRTA, that's what you're gonna get. You're gonna get a DMRTA, you're gonna get a 110 volt wall plug uh, power adapter for it. And that's about it, a little instruction manual in a cardboard box, and that's that. You would need to purchase a microphone separately, you would need to purchase a Bluetooth adapter separately if you want it, that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, it kind of allows you to, to only get the things that you want, or maybe you have a microphone already from your SA3052 or 3055 RTA that you wanna reuse, that's fine, you can do that. Um, so that's why we offer it that way. Not everybody wants it in a case. Some guys want to put four screws in it and mount it to a, a testing cart, tuning cart. That's fine. You don't need to buy it in the case necessarily if you don't want to. So, but we do get asked a lot, hey, how can I get it in that cool blue case? Well, the next one over that you see is the base kit and on the far side is the pro kit. Uh, the pro kit is probably one of the more popular things that people are asking about right now. The pro kit is everything that you can need or want all in one piece. So the pro kit comes in that blue kind of Pelican style protective case. It's got the laser cut foam, all of your accessories in, are in there. And uh, when I say all of the accessories, here's what comes in the pro kit. You're gonna get the DMRTA itself. You're gonna get our CM10 microphone, the microphone cable, You've got our ACBT24 Bluetooth chip. Uh, it's gonna come with the normal 110 volt power adapter that always comes with it, but it's also gonna come with a 12 volt cigarette lighter style power adapter. And then it comes with two sets of test leads. One of them is RCA to spring-loaded uh, test clip, 
and the other one is Phoenix connector or speaker wire to a spring loaded test clip. So that, that pro kit really has pretty much everything that you can think of. It also has two USB cables in there, one to go from the DMRTA to your computer for control. And then it also comes with a uh, USB like this, which is a male to male uh, USB A to USB A. And this is what we would use to play files off of the DMRTA into maybe an aftermarket or factory head unit that has a USB input. And we'll cover more about that in a moment. If you already bought your DMRTA and maybe you got a microphone and you have the Bluetooth chip, you're like, you know what, man, I really wish I would have got that case. Uh, maybe I should have waited, da, 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 da. Okay, well, you don't have to. You can get just what's called the base kit. So the DMRTA base kit does not include a DMRTA. It does not include a microphone. It does not include a Bluetooth chip because we're kind of assuming you probably already purchased those things. So if you have your DMRTA, you've already been using it, you already have your microphone, and you just wanna get the case with all the other little uh, test leads and accessories, you can order yourself a base kit and kind of complete your setup if that's what you wanna do. So I just wanna spend a moment, kind of go over that stuff and, and give people an idea of what comes in each uh, because it is a question we get asked almost daily. Um, on to what do we need to test? Before we get into the checklist itself, I wanna go over a little bit about how to test and what we're gonna to need to do it. So with the DMRTA itself, as you can see, there's multiple inputs and outputs. There's lots of different ways to go about this. How you're going to test or what you need to test is really gonna depend more on the equipment installed and the vehicle itself than anything. So for example, if we're gonna play a test tone or pink noise, out of our DMRTA into our factory system, we need to get that in there somehow, right? So how are we gonna do that? Well, if the car has a factory auxiliary input, great. We can just use a cable like I have shown on your screen there or what's in my hands here, which is just an RCA to eighth inch headphone jack style cable, okay? So we would just go from the outputs of the DMRTA, okay, right here to the aux in on your factory stereo or aftermarket stereo. And now when we're in the DMRTA software and we click pink noise, now the DMRTA is playing pink noise out of this connector into that factory or aftermarket system. Now, same scenario, maybe we wanna play test tones uh, or pink noise, and maybe it's a really new car that doesn't have an aux in. Maybe it just has Bluetooth and USB. I've been hit with that question a few times too. That's fine, we can do that. If you have our base kit or pro kit, it came with this cable. This is again, your USB A to A, male to male cable. I'll get that a little bit closer to the camera there so you can see what that looks like. It's also in the middle of your screen there, the blue USB cable. Now this one, you're gonna take and you're gonna plug into the face of the DMRTA right over here, okay? And then this end, you're just gonna plug into your aftermarket or factory stereo. Now here's the thing where people get confused. If you're gonna play pink noise or sine wave, square wave info, uh, test tone, whatever it is, out of the DMRTA using this cable, if you're gonna use USB, you are not going to control it from the DMRTA software, okay? You're gonna control it from the source unit. So if it's got a, a Kenwood or Pioneer Alpine radio in the dash and you wanna use USB, great, plug this in, but now you're gonna go to that Pioneer, Kenwood, Alpine, whatever, radio and that's where you're going to find pink noise and hit play okay so it's a little bit different when you're doing it through usb think of it like that there's a thumb drive built into this because that's essentially what it is okay so i know that uh catches a lot of guys up and they go well how come i can't hit play why isn't this working that's usually why is generally speaking they're just not um accessing it the right way they're trying to play it from the software rather than going in through the uh in dash hardware and playing it from there so just wanted to cover that a little bit and, and make sure the guys understand that. Um, the other thing that you're gonna need if you're doing any sort of polarity checking or RTA tuning at the end of your install is you're gonna need a microphone, okay? The microphone itself, we offer several different microphones. The most popular two are the CM10, which is shown in the middle of your screen right now, or the CM20, which I have sitting right over here on the desk here. This is the CM20, it's the little bit longer one, okay? So we have those couple of different microphones. Um, there are slight variations in those in uh, quality and price and um, uh, frequency response and that sort of thing. You know, if you're just looking for a, a 
more expensive or more inexpensive every day, just kind of basic microphone. The CM20 is gonna work really well for a lot of things. The CM10 is tried and true. That's the silver one on your screen. That's a little bit robust, more robust microphone, a little bit uh, uh, sturdier mic as well. Um, and that one has been around for a while. That's uh, one that you may already have if you have a SA3052 or SA3055 RTA. So just kind of keep that in mind. If you already have that microphone and you want to use that, you certainly can, okay? The DMRTA has the profiles built into it for the CM10, CM20 uh, microphones in there. Uh, another question I get sometimes is, hey, I have an XLR mic that I want to use, but it's not an audio control microphone. Can I still use it? You can. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that you are going to need to know what type of mic gain or input gain needs to be used with that microphone. So you'll need to find out from the microphone manufacturer what it is that we need to do um, to make it accurate, basically, or, or make it work properly. Now, that won't be as important with RTA as it would be with SPL. Um, to get an accurate re with reading with SPL, you would absolutely need to know that. So now that we've covered the DMRTA and kind of what we need uh, to use and what tools we need and all that stuff, now we can kind of get started a little bit with our checklist and moving into actually, say, pulling in the car and getting started. So the checklist is on your screen in front of you. This is what you would have if you printed it out. This is the PDF itself. Um, we've revised this several times. If you have an older version of it, I would recommend downloading the latest one from our Facebook page, um, that sort of thing, because it has been updated a couple of times. Uh, so work in progress. We've taken in input from uh, dealers and reps all across the country and kind of collaborated together to uh, put this together. So we're going to start at the top and kind of work our way through this. And uh, if uh, Chris gets any good questions or anything that we need to come up with, he'll kind of jump in and, and help out with that and uh, interject here and there. Yeah, there's a few questions already for Jonathan. What is the current value of the 110 AC? So um, in South Africa, they use a different, you know, 220, uh, 240. Sure. Um, I would have to look at exactly what that is as far as the... I don't know if you, we... Well, here's the, good, here's the good news about that, okay? The power plug that comes with the DMRTA that plugs into the wall that's 110 AC, it's actually converting to 12 volt DC. So if you want to charge this thing from 12 volt DC, you can. You could easily take the adapter that comes with it and cut it off, okay, and hardwire it to 12 volt DC, just like you would in a car or anything else, and you could absolutely charge your DMRTA that way. Um, I have a mobile testing rig that I take with me around the country sometimes. That's how mine is wired up. Just be really careful that you make sure that you get those wires correct. We obviously don't want to um, invert polarity on that. So that would be one option if you wanted to charge it off your test bench or you know something like that. You certainly can. Um, otherwise, I don't know the exact amperage on that charger. I think it's like a you know little three or four amp uh, little yeah. AC to DC charger. It's 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 nothing crazy. It's it's a pretty standard piece. So. And Brett asked, can the Bluetooth module also transmit signals from the DMRTA? So that's a great question. That so is a great question. Since they are two isolated and separate Bluetooth chips, um, essentially I will do that um, in some cases, but I will use um, something hard um, on the device. So like if I'm using my iPad, I will place, play my test tones through Bluetooth from files that I have on my iPad. It will not transmit from the DMRTA right. output. Otherwise, it would have to be um, set up as a separate source in the DMRTA, which is not possible. So they're two different Bluetooths. Yep. So um, think yep. of it kind of like a radio in your dashboard. If you put in a, a Pioneer, Kenwood, Alpine, whatever, can it play Bluetooth out? No, it can only receive, right? The Bluetooth chip that we have for this is the same way. It can receive audio, it cannot send out audio. Um, it can receive commands or, or software commands from our app, same thing like a radio can, but it cannot send out. So that's the way I always kind of um, tell guys about that to think of it, because it's the same thing just like most Bluetooth devices. It can only receive, it cannot send. Yep. And uh, let's see here. Somebody has questions about D-series amplifiers and how to set input gain when I have the volume at the head unit up to where it clips. One of the things that you have to remember is that you want to go through and test your clipping signal right from the source all the way through. So, and when you're doing it, you're going to go ahead and start at the source, see where clipping happens, then go through the input. There are times when you're sending a signal out of something 
like if you're sending a signal out into a 3.5 input, a lot of companies max 3.5 input is going to be in the millivolt sections mm -hmm. and you will clip that input. So it's really important to look at what you're sending out from your source and how it works downstream. So you always want to look at input first, then output in the D series amplifiers and see, because it really, when you think about the D series amplifiers and having an input um, as well as an output level adjustment, you have to think of it as two different things because you don't want to saturate inputs, right? right? But you want to get the most out of it. So if you're at max level output and you're playing with the input, you can see it um, on the input view screen. So it's, it's kind of a challenge. There is a ton of room for finessing that. And yeah. you always want to try to get, make sure you get the maximum out of it. So um, I think in one of the more technical ones, we will go through and show you exactly because you, you would need to look at each of those inputs individually yeah. because when you're messing with the outputs on the D amplifiers, it's the outputs of the summed inputs. Right. So it's not just like, oh, here's how you do it because you're going to have to watch the summed output as well. If you don't have clipping on one input and clipping on another, it, you're summing those, well, that's going to carry through. So yeah. it's kind there's, of- There's a lot more to it than just here's how. Yeah. There's a lot of variables there. I yeah, that's say. a lot of finessing. And yeah. so I think um, that one is, is uh, something that we'll do when we're actually in a vehicle. So yeah. we can show you how that can happen. Yeah. But we have done it on test benches here where we're sending information out of a DMRTA into like a cheap 3.5 um, source unit. Uh, like an entry level aftermarket head unit. And you can see when you're over driving the inputs as well. Oh, so absolutely. Yeah. So that's another thing that, uh, that you need to be mindful of. Yeah. And one of the things to, to keep in mind on those D series and really any amplifier, um, whether it's ours or not, uh, but especially with ours is, you know, a lot of these newer products have like a input level max light. We have the milk lights on ours. We have the maximized input, maximized output, all those things. I think a lot of guys get really hung up on like, I need to see that light, right? Mm -hmm. But you're not always going to see that light is just the, the fact of it, right? So we only have so much, you know, tolerance on that light of here's what trips that light, here's what doesn't, so on and so forth. And I think a lot of guys look at them and go, well, I'm not getting the lights to light up. I'm not getting the most out of this amplifier. There are going to be situations where that light is not going to light up, but you are still getting the most out of it. Sometimes your signal is just in such a way that it's not going to light up. So just kind of keep that in mind that don't get too hung up on seeing a little light blink. <laughs> so let's see. Um, and then SID Customs did say you can still add tracks into the thumb drive section of the DM. So yeah. even if you can't stream, you can still go through and put all your test tracks yep. onto the USB and then play test tracks and stuff that way as well. That's a great point. And I've covered that in some previous trainings and stuff, um, but to elaborate on that a little bit or expand on that a little bit. If you're using the cable like I showed a minute ago where it is um, USB to USB, just the USB A male to male cable like this guy here. Um, yes, plug this into the front of the DMRTA. The DMRTA doesn't even have to be powered on. Plug the other end into your computer and you're going to see a little uh, icon pop up on your desktop or in your my computer folder that says DMRTA. It is essentially a thumb drive. Double click on that. You'll see some folders in there that hold the pink noise and all the test tracks. But now you can drag and drop, you know, 100 or 200 of your favorite test tracks or, you know, music tracks or whatever it is that you want to put on there for testing. Um, it really doesn't matter. It's basically a thumb drive inside. So even if you want to have a folder of MP3s and then a folder of FLAC files so that you can do comparisons or whatever you want to do, you can certainly do that. All right, let's go over to the uh, chimes and alerts yeah, part of the DMRTA checklist. So first thing is chimes and alerts. I think a lot of guys forget about this and they skip right over it. Um, what I would do, excuse me, is with this printed out in the car, first thing I would do when I pull it in, you know, most of us have gotten a good habit over the years of checking everything when we pull in the car, right? Hopefully um, you are checking turn signals and you know lights and check engine lights and does the heater work and all that stuff. Hopefully you've gotten in a good habit over the years of checking all those things. If you're not, uh, you should be uh, just to protect yourself and liability. But after you do that check, 
I would grab my checklist like I have on this clipboard and start doing this checklist, okay? First, you pulled in the car, you did your work order, your checklist, you made sure all the turn signals and windshield wipers worked and all that. Now you grab your audio control checklist and go through and start checking the audio side of things, right? So on the top of the checklist too, there is a section just above chimes and alerts that says notes issues with vehicle. Make sure you mark down if a speaker doesn't work or if one of the speakers sounds scratchy or one of the channels drops in and out. The last thing you wanna do is get your install all done and then and at the very end have one channel dropping in and out and little did you know, that's actually been a problem since the get-go. Maybe it's an issue with the factory radio. Maybe it's an issue with the factory amplifier. But if you didn't check it when it came in, now you're just, you know, needle in a haystack trying to find an issue that may have been already there, okay? But on the chimes and alerts, go through and double check all of the factory features. So if it has navigation, go through and put in an address in the nav system and see where that navigation prompt comes from. Maybe it comes only from the center channel. Maybe it comes from both the front speakers. Maybe it comes out of all of them, who knows? But you wanna make sure that you find out because unfortunately what happens for a lot of guys is they go, okay, great. Uh, I've got this vehicle, I'm working on it. Hey, the back doors, the signal running to the back doors is full range, awesome. I'm just gonna use that as my signal and I'll run the whole system off just those two channels. Hey, that's totally fine, man. If they're okay with losing fading capability and you've got full range on the backdoor signals, great, use it. However, what if all of your turn signal chimes, navigation prompts, and your Bluetooth uh, phone call audio information, what if that all comes out of the front speakers? Well, now your customer just lost all of that stuff. And I can pretty much guarantee your customer is not going to be okay with losing those features, right? I mean, you could make the best sounding audio system in there that you can, but if he just lost all those features we talked about, probably not going to be a happy camper. So this is really just more of a reminder to go through and do that, um, but it is important. So if you do get a couple of channels in this vehicle, let's just say, for example, on this one, um, we listen to it and the tones and chimes for the turn signals and the navigation do come out of the front speakers. Okay, well now we know that at some point we're gonna have to keep that in there. Um, whether we feed that into another input and, and dumb it down a little bit so that the chimes aren't so loud, that's fine, but we do know we're gonna have to integrate that in there somehow. If the only thing that comes out of the speakers is just turn signal chimes or something like that, hey, maybe your customer doesn't care. Maybe they'd like to have those gone. You know, Maybe they find the headlight chime annoying or the leave your keys in the ignition chime annoying. Who knows? But you're gonna wanna find out. The other reason to find out is, is if you're gonna amplify those channels and you do use those for input, if we amplify some channels that have a, a chime coming through them and you're not conscious of that, you can really, really have a super loud chime when that install is done. Again, great sounding install, but when they open the door, it takes that old chime and makes it, you know, 20 times louder than it used to be. They're probably not going to love that either. So it's just things to be kind of conscious of. So as you're working through this checklist, okay, fine. We found out that the turn signal chimes, the navigation prompts, and the Bluetooth uh, phone call information all comes out of the front speakers. So on my checklist, I would just mark down here, um, you know, chimes come out of front speakers from fronts and basically move on. So one of the other things too is like, um, as more and more of you guys start seeing late model vehicles, you're going to need help with this. Um, uh, so single guy shops or installers, um, you know, you're gonna wanna check your, you know, your, your lane assist stuff. So yep. this is gonna take a test drive to check lane assist on That's stuff. That's a good one. You're gonna have to check backup sensors. That's so if you're, one. I mean, the second you have an SUV that runs into your store, or if you yeah. have an SUV that you're, that you're breaking into and starting to do the work, before you touch anything, you yep. need to know if the backup sensors come out of, you know, some speaker that you didn't even know existed in the back of the vehicle. So, you know, explorers and, you know, all yep. the Ford uh, SUVs, um, and any of the, the late model SUVs, even Kia now, you know, is having more and more lane assist and more and more backup sensors. And they are, you know, if you have a 13 speaker system in the car, you know, you might see chimes, navigation, um, make a Bluetooth call, you know, do yeah, all of that stuff absolutely. to make sure that all aspects of it are there and you know where that signal is coming from, from all aspects. Yeah, I've worked on some SUVs before where the, the rear, um, the sensors that are in the back bumper for backup sensors 
uh, come out of just two little speakers in the C pillars. Again, if you go to the factory head unit or amplifier and disconnect everything and just use the front four channels of input or for your inputs, well, now he just lost all that you know, backup sensor audio information. Um, so it's just something to be conscious of. That was a, a great one, Chris. The, the driver assistance systems, um, like he said, that's super, super common now. You know, I mean, even inexpensive cars are coming with lane departure warning systems and this, that, and the other. You need to find out where that audio comes from. So let's move on to the next part of it, which is polarity testing. So when you are doing this test, you are gonna need a couple of things. We need to feed audio info from the DMRTA into the factory or aftermarket radio. Um, this whole checklist is really about OEM integration. So when I'm talking about this, just plan on the car or think of the car having a factory radio. So you need to get audio from this DMRTA into this factory radio. Like we talked about a few minutes ago, we can either go in through the aux in, we can go in through the USB input, or if it doesn't have any of those and you have to Bluetooth into it, then you're gonna need to use your phone or a tablet to Bluetooth into the radio and you're gonna need to find you know, your test tones, pink noise, whatever, uh, elsewhere or have it already stored on your phone. So in this case, we're talking about checking polarity. Let's say that the car does have an aux in. Okay, great. We would use the uh, black cable like I, I had here. I'm sure you all have one of these at your shop. If you don't, I'm sure they're inexpensive, just RCA to uh, headphone jack style cable. So hook it up to the outputs of the DMRTA, hook it up to the aux input on the radio. And now you're gonna take your microphone and you're gonna use this on a, on a mic cable like I have here, have it on a mic extension. And basically what you're gonna do is go into the DMRTA software, you're gonna use the polarity checker tab and you're gonna click start measurement. When you click start measurement, you are going to see it put a big positive or negative in the middle of the screen, okay? When we see that come up, that's basically telling you, is the speaker pushing out or is the speaker pulling back? Now, I usually recommend guys fade and balance to each corner of the vehicle as they do this test and hold the microphone close to each speaker. Um, you don't wanna just have the microphone in the middle of the car going around. You might be picking up signals from other stuff. So kind of be, uh, uh, be cognizant of that when you're doing it. Um, the other question I get sometimes is, okay, well, what if the car doesn't have an aux in and I want to still do this polarity test? Well, there is no uh, polarity test info on the USB portion, so you would need to use your phone and Bluetooth into that customer's radio at that point and do it that way. So once you've done that, uh, go to the chart at the bottom of the checklist and record your results. The bottom of the checklist has a whole chart down there for all of the different drivers that are in the car, most likely anyway. And you can go through there and just put a plus or, or minus on each one. Now, if the car is totally stock, you may be thinking, why do I need to do this test? Uh, of course, everything's gonna be wired correctly. It's not so much that it's wired correctly or incorrectly, it's that a lot of times these manufacturers are purposely wiring few drivers out of phase from the rest of the system. Sometimes it's to create some sort of uh, imaging or sound staging. Sometimes it's to uh, help with ANC or whatever the case may be. So it's definitely something to be aware of and it's something that you definitely want to test for. Do you have a, um, uh, an RCA to probe test as well? Yep. Another, another thing to remember guys is that um, is that if you're testing a system that's already been installed and you're going through and doing the polarity, if you're, if you're checking a coax or a three-way um, speaker to make sure that you're trying to get it, and say it's behind the door panel and you just hold the microphone right up there, you wanna make sure you're trying to only read the mid-range on there because a lot of times um, speaker manufacturers will flip the, uh, the, the two-way aspect out of phase in there so you want to bypass that um, this is probably one of the most overlooked um, aspects of testing um, and then you're flipping it on the back side when you could have done it wired it correctly on the front side so just because it's OE doesn't mean you're gonna have to you know be able to go and grab wires and pin one and three of every one is positive right so and another thing to keep in mind too is is if you do need to do polarity testing without a microphone maybe you want to test directly the leads themselves you can you do not have to use the microphone when doing polarity testing. It's gonna be the most common way to do it, but you can do it electrically as well. 
So you can either make one of these cables yourself, or if you have our base kit or pro kit, it's gonna come with it. And that is a Phoenix connector, which is our little speaker connector, little four pin connector. Most of you guys are probably familiar with that. And this one ends up in some nice spring-loaded test connectors, okay? So these are spring-loaded. They have kind of a little uh, J-shaped copper on the end. And so you can just clip those onto a couple of leads in a Molex connector or right at the back of the speaker. So if you're not sure even, maybe you're doing a system and you just can't find any info on what is positive and negative at each speaker, you know, you've, you can see the colors there, but you just don't know what's what. Um, if you have access to the speaker itself, you could actually clip right onto it, do this polarity test, record your results, and now you're gonna know exactly what's what at the end of the day. So again, that lead is one of the ones that's in the pro kit and the base kit. Another one that's in the pro kit and base kit while we're talking about it is a similar cable ending up again in a uh, test clip. So it is red and black, spring loaded, just like I said. And the other end of this one is RCA. So we have a low level and a speaker level uh, test clip included in those kits. And this is, and again, just checking this on your work as well as what's coming from the factory is probably one of the most overlooked and, and, and most, uh, most common mistakes in audio. Absolutely. I mean, it, by far, and I'm just looking at uh, one of our reps, Dan, here, where you know there's been several times where we've gone to places and tried to show them stuff, and we get into an install, and within moments, we know that even though the wiring may be all boom, 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 straightforward, yep. um, the result is, is completely incorrect. And, uh, and it is, I mean, it's sad to think about how much um, vehicles are being shipped out there with this this yeah. this wired incorrectly. So. I can't tell you how many times guys call me and ask me to help them with a DSP or hey, this doesn't sound right. Can you help me tune it? You know, whatever it is. Obviously, it's really hard for us to help tune a car over the phone or over Team Viewer. We'll do our best with you. Um, but the biggest thing I'll usually ask guys before we ever get into DSP tuning and stuff is, have you verified that everything is you know correct? And of course they always say yes, but a lot of times if I actually get to be there at their shop and hear the car, a lot of times you'll look through and you'll hear it and you'll go, oh no, something's wrong, you know? And usually within a few minutes, you find out that at least one speaker is backwards or something is wired out of base. Even on the D uh, amplifier, so another way that you can look at this um, if you're verifying stuff is, even though you may not want to have a summed output out of a D or, uh, amplifier or DSP, you can go through and sum your inputs and outputs together. And if you see any cancellations in, in the RTA, you know you have something wrong. Yep. I mean, we've been on tech support call after tech support call where I can go through and just say, oh, well, let's go ahead and sum one, two, three, and four together. And then all of a sudden we see that RTA start to collapse or, you know, you see something happen and you're like, nah, dude, you got something wired wrong. Like it's, it becomes really evident when you know what you're looking for in that regard, where even if you don't have a DM RTA, mm -hmm. you can use the D uh, smart app and the DSP or um, the D amplifiers and see where an installer has actually made mistakes on wiring the inputs. Yeah, it's very revealing. <laughs> it pretty much instantly shows that there's a problem. So moving on from checking polarity to check voltage, this is gonna be the next section. So um, in this image here, uh, you'll see there that says connect audio output, play sine wave at one kilohertz. So the, the frequency that you play is gonna really depend on what you're doing. If you are installing a multi-channel system and you're installing a, a four channel and a sub amp or a five channel amplifier, then yes, you are gonna wanna use something like that. The rule of thumb here basically is to play a frequency that the speaker you're about to integrate would play. So for example, if all you're doing is installing a uh, add-on amplifier and a subwoofer, then we would wanna actually do this test with like a 60 hertz test tone rather than 1000. If you are doing a multi-channel amplifier, excuse me, you would wanna use something like a thousand hertz, something that would be more or less, you know, not full range, but something that a full range speaker would play. So you're doing this test really to find out, you guys, what is it that I've found? What is it that I'm tapping into? So if I find a set of twisted leads in the kick panel and I tap into those and I hook up a test speaker real quick or whatever and find out, oh, these are the speaker wires or I verify that they are the wires in my DMRTA, great, but what are they? Is this 
uh, before it's going out to a factory amplifier? Is this after it's on its way back from the factory amp out to the uh, passenger door speaker? Is this, you know, what is this? Is this deck power? Is there no factory amp? How do we know what that is? Yeah, of course, you can search for the amplifier. Maybe you know where it is, maybe you don't. But you could also just tap onto a speaker. Let's say the car has speakers in the rear deck even. Great, even easier. You could literally clip onto those speaker leads and find out within a couple of seconds whether it's deck power or whether it's amplified. And you're gonna know that just based on the voltage. So you're gonna play that tone using the voltage meter. And like you can see on your screen here, it's gonna tell you over on the side there, if it's less than five volts, this is what we're looking at. If it's five to 12, we've got deck power. And if it's 13 volts or more, you know, these are rough numbers, of course, but they give you an idea. That's usually going to be uh, amplified speaker level. So it's usually a premium system. So if you see a signal that's only a couple of volts, chances are that is preamp signal in most cases, or a really, really, really low deck power. Okay. So those at least give you an idea. But again, once you have it kind of categorized and you've kind of figured out and verified that that's what it is, um, by the end of this checklist, now we're going to know, okay, this is what I'm going to need to integrate because this is the type of signal that I have. Yeah, also it might be good um, for some of you guys out there, if you're working on a car that doesn't have a USB input, it just has a 3.5 from the factory that you're using, ask the customer what they're using to send signal through that. So yeah. if they're using an older iPhone or something that has a 3.5 output, you, you should understand that that has a 500 milliamp um, output, yeah. right? So then you can test your systems by sending out of the DMRTA a 500 milliamp test. You don't want to send a full five volt and right. then plug in with something that has less, less input. So yeah. um, make sure you have full control over what you're doing with the DMRTA and going through the checklist, understanding what the sources are. So you can go through your factory source unit, set it all flat, do all that stuff. And then if you're sending a stronger signal into it, and then they plug theirs in, they, it might not be as dynamic. Yeah, yeah so. it's going to be different results for yeah. sure. And that's something to keep in mind with, with every customer, really. I mean, if you're talking to your customers, what I used to do at my shop was ask them first, what do you listen to, right? And I don't mean country or hip hop or rock. I mean, are they playing crappy, low quality files off YouTube for free? Or are they playing uh, Tidal, you know, and streaming high res files? Uh, that's important. We need to know that. Are they playing through an aux in with that title? Okay, well then it's not really high res, right? Or are they playing, um, you know, straight through USB? Or are they playing through Bluetooth? Or what's what's their main source? Maybe they still listen to the radio a lot, AM, FM. Maybe they listen to CDs, whatever it is. But you kind of need to know because there can be some dramatic differences in the signal from each of those sources. I've seen some factory radios where the difference between aux USB, Bluetooth, and CD were dramatic differences between those. So you really kind of need to uh, ask your customer a little bit um, what they're going to use and, and what's most likely so that you can set this up as best you can. So moving on through here, you guys, since we want to try to stay on time, the next one we're going to do is we're going to check for clipping. If you look at this as we're going through the checklist, you guys, it says find max volume. On the right hand side, it says use the oscilloscope. If you print out this checklist, there are big blue boxes down the side and they say, use the oscilloscope, use the RTA, da, 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 da. It is telling you what tab of the DMRTA software to use, okay? We tried to make it as uh, clear as it could possibly be. So you're gonna use the oscilloscope tab, you're gonna find max volume using either a 60 hertz sine wave or a 1000 hertz sine wave, depending on what you're doing, whether you're putting in sub amp or full range. And we're gonna find out basically where that head unit clips. Again, super, super important because I can't tell you how many shops call me and we talk about setting up gains, setting up this, uh, setting up a DSP, doing this, that, and the other, but they have no idea where the factory radio clips. You know, the factory radio plays up to 60. Uh, oh, we figured 35 is max volume. Is it? I mean, you have no idea if 35 is max volume. You're guessing. The, some shops would say 45 or 50 is max volume, right? So it just really depends. You need to find out. There are some factory radios that don't clip at all. They're clean all the way to the top. There's some factory radios that clip at 50% volume, right? So it's things that you just, you're going to need to know. Um, and it's something that really you should be finding out like this checklist early on. You should find all this stuff out before we ever put anything in the car. Okay, so go through, find out your max volume. The checklist has a spot for you to write it down. 
And now this is something at the end of the install too, you can show your customer and go, look, before we touched your car, we went through and we did this whole checklist analyzing your car's factory system. And here's what we found. And if volume 45 is max volume out of 50, then you know now there's a, a reason behind it. Now there's a reason you're telling your customer, hey, please don't go past 45, not just, oh, that's about you know 75% uh, of your volume or whatever thing people tell uh, their customers. We wanna be specific, we wanna be sure. We don't wanna lose, any, lose anything and leave any volume on the table, but we also don't wanna drive the system into distortion causing failures and problems and, and uh, you know, defects and all that stuff. So this one is, is super, super important. Um, when you're using the oscilloscope, if you've never used one before, you don't know what clipping looks like, clipping is gonna look like, so you've got your nice round waveforms on there. When they go flat at the top or bottom, or they start to kind of shark, uh, shark tail on there, or, or shark fin on there, I should say, when they go at an angle like that, that's when you're starting to run into some uh, distortion. And it's very visible on the oscilloscope. Of course, we could make this training two or three hours long and uh, you know, have a car here and go through every single one of these and show them, and that would be awesome, but it would also be a two or three hour training. So we are expecting that you uh, uh, have at least a little bit of knowledge of what some of this stuff looks like. So let's move on from clipping to our next category, which is, is it crossed over? So we wanna check for full range. Uh, this is another common one that a lot of shops make a mistake on. Um, they tap a signal, they maybe use a test speaker to see if that uh, signal is full range, or they put their ear up to that specific speaker and they go, oh yeah, there's, there's bass, mid, and treble coming out of that speaker, so it's full range. Mm, is it? Is it really full range? Do you know that it's full range? Or again, are you guessing? Because if you don't use an RTA to find out, then you're guessing. So using an RTA, again, it tells you right there what tab to use. Make sure that everything is centered. Make sure bass uh, treble, balance fader, all that stuff is centered on the factory head unit. Turn off any sort of EQ stuff or any sort of uh, sound controlled volume or uh, Dolby or whatever the radio has. Turn all that stuff to flat or off before you do this testing. And then hook up to the channels you think you are going to use or you're planning on maybe using and find out with your RTA if they're full range. Um, I've got a couple of uh, slides here coming up where you can see what that looks like. So this is a 2016 Accord, or excuse me, Acura uh, front door signal. Now, is this full range? Well, it has audio information all the way across, uh, but I don't know that I would quite call it full range, right? This has some uh, pretty heavy curve. If we look at the next one, this is the front dash speakers in that same Acura. Now again, uh, some would argue that there's audio information all the way across, but this is definitely crossed over. Okay. That is definitely high frequency information only, and the previous slide was definitely mid and lower information only. If you were to use this signal to drive your new components that you just put in with your four channel amplifier, you are going to end up with a system that has very little high frequency response, and you're going to end up having to EQ the hell out of that thing to try to make it sound even remotely decent, right? That's not what we wanna do. We wanna use the EQ to make minor adjustments and, and contour things the way we want and maybe correct for some deficiencies and tune for preference, but we don't wanna to have to use the EQ, you guys, to try to do these massive corrections. If you're doing massive corrections with EQ, then chances are the signal is either really, really terrible or it's not the right signal. You're not tapped into the right thing. So moving through those again, that was the doors, this is the dash. Here's another example for you. This is an 18 Honda Accord. Uh, this one also, again, at first glance, it kind of looks like full range because there's information all the way across, but it's actually pre-crossed over. This car has a permanent high pass filter where it just has very little bass response below about 60 Hertz. You can see right there on the RTA screen, sorry, it's not a great image, but you get the idea. You can see on the RTA there that, uh, you know, the bass response from about 60, 80 Hertz and down is a significant slope, right? So you're gonna have a pretty poor bass response if that's all you have in there. So again, you would look at that and go, okay, if this is the only signal available in that car, you would look at that and go, I know I'm gonna need something if this is what it looks like at all volumes, okay? You would know that you're gonna need an epicenter. If it looked like this only at certain volumes, but at lower volume it was fine, you'd know that you need a product with AccuBase, right? So there's always a, a more to it than just RTA to see if it's full range. It's also gonna help you to decide what products to integrate with, which is why that stuff's at the bottom of the checklist.
Yeah, more and more cars are coming with, you know, with, with multi-channels um, and guys will use an LC6i or LC7i all the time. Um, you know, one of the best things that you could do for a, a new car is amplify it. And there's hundreds of cars out there that you can go straight in, straight out and re-EQ and have fantastic results, like fantastic results. Yeah. Sometimes you are going to be better picking and choosing which speakers you will amplify with a straight in, straight out, already pre-EQ'd from the factory system, mm -hmm. and then EQing that to try to make up for whatever, you know, the factory speaker was EQ'd at. So, you know, this is probably one of the, uh, another more common mistake is going through and not testing what you have to work with from the factory as far as crossover. So mm -hmm. again, I know it takes time, but if you want to have the best results, you know, the time up front is going to save you on the, the time on the backside and, sure. and having a customer come back or, you know, having you sitting out there for three hours playing with your DSP, yeah. you know, and then realizing, hey, you know what? Uh, I could have had the same results without some of these channels. Yeah. Or, I think that's the biggest thing. Yeah. A lot of guys just get super hung up on, oh, they're, they're pre-crossed over. I have to sum. We have to sum. Well, you don't always have to sum. In a lot of situations, sure, it makes sense. But in a lot of these newer cars, like Chris said, if there's, you know, especially these larger multi-channel systems, you may be way better off to just pass the signal in, amplify it, EQ it, pass the signal out, keep the channels separate, keep them the way that they were. And a lot of times, like he said, you can have some amazing results with that. Even using factory speakers a lot of times, you know, there are a lot of systems where guys are just looking for a modest upgrade. A lot of times even keeping those speakers and just amplifying them can make a big difference in that. So moving on here a little bit, uh, these are a couple of just examples too. I mean, obviously these are pretty drastic, but I wanted to show you guys kind of what that looks like. So the very top signal there is gonna be low base only. This would be an example from a car with a factory three-way component setup, uh, maybe a, a Audi or some of those Scion TCs that had the three-way components, that sort of thing. So this is a factory three-way component set. Top uh, RTA graph there is just base only. The middle one there is mid-range only, and the bottom is high frequency only. So that would be like a, say a six, three tweet setup or something along those lines. That's what those signals are gonna look like. Now, if that's what's in the front of the car and it just has those in the front and a set of coaxials in the back, you've got a choice to make. You can either sum those signals together to achieve full range and maintain the fading in the car if the customer really wants to maintain fader, or if the rear doors or rear channels are just full range to begin with, maybe you go the easier route, just use those rear channels for your full range signal. And yes, the customer is going to lose the ability to fade at that point. But a lot of customers are not going to mind that if it means less products or less labor dollars or whatever the case may be. Um, or maybe it's a situation where you only have certain gear to work with and you just don't have enough input channels to accommodate that and do summing okay, fine, maybe we're gonna do uh, just those rear channels and lose fade and it's just the way that it is. Um, sometimes that's just a fact of life. That's just the way it goes, right? So I just wanted to kind of show what those look like. Um, also, I have on here just in a perfect world, this would be full range. The reason I bring this up, you guys, is I also like to make clear when I'm doing these trainings and stuff, this is not what you are gonna see when you find full range, okay? In a perfect world, yes, this would be awesome. If we pulled up a set of speaker signals and this is what we saw on our RTA and it's perfectly flat all the way across, that would just be fantastic. But in the real world, full range is generally not going to look like this, okay? Even playing pink noise through a you know, relatively perfect system, this is just not really what full range looks like. So keep in mind that you may listen to a car that, that maybe you did a while ago and you didn't have an RTA and the car sounds great and you think it sounds awesome, the customer's happy with it, but maybe it comes back for something and just for the, for the heck of it, you decide to throw an RTA in there and find out. You may look at the response or, or the uh, inputs and go, wow, this has got all sorts of dips and valleys in it. Keep in mind that a car can still sound really, really good without having flat, okay? In fact, most customers are not going to love a car that's flat, right? I think a lot of guys get really, really hung up on trying to achieve flat frequency response or flat full range. Um, and it's, first of all, it's just generally not going to happen. Uh, but second of all, your customer probably won't love it. They're going to want something that's a little bit more dynamic or a little bit more fun than that in a lot of cases. 
So moving on so that we uh, kind of fit in our time guidelines here, check for OEMEQ, all right? So have a look at the RTA response and find out does the EQ change based on volume? There are a lot of these systems out there, you guys, that have dynamic EQs to where as you turn up and down the volume on the factory stereo, it'll actually change the EQ curve with the volume, right? They're trying to compensate for road noise. They're trying to compensate for uh, windows down. They're trying to compensate for poor quality factory speakers or poor placement or whatever the case may be. But it's all things that you need to take into account. Uh, I know there's some vehicles that are convertibles or vehicles that are uh, removable tops that once the top is taken off, it actually flips a switch and the vehicle knows the top is off and it actually switches the DSP or switches the EQ. I believe some of the new Jeeps do that, I've been told. I know some of the sports cars do that. When they drop the top on a convertible, it actually changes the EQ curve. So it's all things to take into account when you're first pulling that vehicle in and going through and doing some of your testing is find out if it does that because you're gonna need to know. Uh, you know, if, if you're gonna end up doing some EQ work and trying to compensate for something, make sure you're not compensating for uh, top down versus top up or whatever the case may be. You need to take into account both and see what the difference between them is before you get too far uh, through things. And, and make sure too that we're, we're being clear on if it's EQ that you're seeing or whether it's you know a crossover that you're seeing, right? And you're gonna be able to have a look at that. And I've, I've uh, checked out some vehicles recently, uh, newer Chevy truck, um, you know, grabbed the front door signals, I believe it was in this one. And, and that's just from my memory, so don't quote me on that. Uh, but it was full range. It was a full range signal all the way across, but it also had kind of a smiley face curve to it, right? So they had boosted the bass a little bit from the factory and they had boosted the treble a little bit from the factory. You know, they probably figure, hey, this is what most customers want. Let's just build it in and away we go. Now in that one, it was not volume dependent. It had that curve all the time, right? So something to look out for. As we move through this, uh, down here is where you're gonna fill in your answers. So like I said, if you're looking at that checklist while we're going through this, this is where you'd be filling in your answers as you go. Were there chimes and alerts on this channel? What was the polarity? Uh, you know, is it full range? Is it crossed over? If it is crossed over, approximately where is what I would be writing in down here. If it looks like it's got an 80 hertz high pass filter on it, great, right? 80 hertz HPF. You know, like I said, at the end of this whole thing, the whole idea is to be able to glance at this sheet when you're finished and have a game plan, okay? So also look, and, and with the EQ section, you can write yes or no, I guess, if you want to, or you could draw a little picture of the curve in that space. Do whatever you want with it. It's to help you guys. But um, like I said, the idea is to just have something that uh, helps you at the end before you start your install. In the notes section, note anything strange. Note that this channel cuts in and out. Note that this channel works well, doesn't work well, sounds good, doesn't sound good. Uh, you know, maybe which specific chimes come out of that channel, whatever the case may be. And then once you're done with this whole checklist, you guys, uh, you're, the, the biggest thing I think is knowing what integration product you're gonna need to complete it. So obviously, shameless plug, we have some of our products listed down there at the bottom so that you can choose a DM6OH or an LC6I or whatever it is that you're going to need to complete the install. But how nice would it be, again, just to reiterate a little bit, you, you do this whole worksheet, you get your checklist done, and now you can go back up front to your sales guy if, if you're the installer and you've got a sales guy up front and show them this and go, look, uh, we're going to need something that has AccuBase. We're going to need something that does signal summing if they want to keep uh, their fader, you know, and you can go up there with some options. Uh, the last thing you want to do is get into this install and four, five, six, seven, eight hours into it or two days into it, find out that you don't have what you need. Maybe it's a multi-day project, but you should be doing this first thing so that maybe you can order the right parts and have them in time. You can just save so many headaches by doing this right up front and doing it right at the very beginning. So with that, I just wanted to jump in here real quick and say, yeah, I, I'm sorry, everybody, but I got kicked off of the Zoom meeting, and so I don't have any of the uh, chat history or any of the, the questions that came through. But Brett, you did have some great questions, um, and uh, I will try to pull those up at the end here and reach out to you personally and see if there's something we can do. So in the chat, just go ahead and type in your email address for me, Brett. Um, and I can verify uh, when we go back and look at those questions. 
So we try to keep these right around an hour each week, you guys. So we're, uh, we're about an hour and 10 minutes today, so we'll wrap things up. But uh, again, if you have any other questions or anything too, feel free to uh, shoot us an email or drop us a line on Facebook. Um, we have some great groups and stuff too that are very, very helpful. We have the audio control dealer and rep group. If you're an authorized dealer or rep, uh, make sure to join that group. It's a great place to get answers to questions. It's a great place to uh, uh, look at for resources for answers to things when it's after hours or maybe on a weekend. Um, we also post things there as far as software updates, firmware updates, stuff like that. We also have an enthusiast page. The enthusiast page, uh, you know, it's a great place to share pictures of installs or talk thing about things audio control that are a little bit uh, uh, maybe lighter or less technical, that sort of thing. And then um, there's also the question of the ANC mics that gets brought up a lot. Um, I actually have an employee here whose uh, uh, dad's vehicle he brought in today that I'm having a look at. And you know what we're finding out in that one is it has ANC mics in it. The shop that did the install did not disconnect them, it seems. And of course, it's causing problems in there. For those of you that aren't familiar, ANC mics are uh, active noise cancellation. What they literally do is listen to what's going on in the vehicle. They listen for road noise, and then they play that signal back 180 degrees out of phase through the vehicle speakers. It's done to uh, create cancellation and make the interior cabin quieter. But what it really does for us in the audio world is wreaks havoc when we're trying to add aftermarket amps, woofers, speakers, that sort of thing. So um, we get that a lot. We get that question a lot. How am I supposed to deal with ANC? What do I do to deal with ANC? Do you have a product that'll solve ANC? The answer is that you need to disconnect the microphones clip the wire to the microphone, disconnect the module that runs the microphones, whatever that may be, or even take the vehicle into the dealer and ask them to program the ANC system off. Um, but one of the best resources I can give you guys is there's a Facebook group called Where Are All the Mics? It is a group of installation techs that are just sharing info with each other about where the microphones are, if a vehicle has them or doesn't, and how to disconnect them or how to disable that system. So again, that one has nothing to do with audio control directly. It's just a resource that I want a lot of people to join. So I think the more guys get on that group, the more powerful and, and useful it is.